Uh, thanks for the, inf uh, the invitation to be here. Really pleased to be at the launch of, of, of the report. Um, that's who I am. That's the organisation that I represent. Can I just have a quick knowledge check? Who's ever heard of us? Be honest. Oh, that's really impressive. <laughs> Who's got a reasonable understanding of what we do? Okay. Well, hopefully the rest of you know a little bit more by the time I've finished, hopefully. Uh, if any of you are tweeting... Uh, our Twitter, my Twitter handle's up there. My, it proves to my boss that I'm actually doing something. Um, but please don't follow me unless you, you're non-politically correct. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning of our organisation with Morecambe Bay. I'm going to show you a very quick video. It's only three minutes long. And then I'll explain why 15 years later we're still looking at this video and still referring back to Morecambe Bay. Cockle picker Lee Hua now lives under witness protection having given evidence in the criminal trial that followed the tragedy. He was within seconds of becoming a victim himself, trapped while attempting to help others who wouldn't survive the night. When did you first realise that you were in serious danger? And that's not just all. That was when the water covered the wheel and the vehicle couldn't move. Everyone was panicking. They got out of the vehicle and tried to swim. But the water was flowing so quickly, some would drag under it straight away. I was in despair. I thought, am I going to die tonight? I have parents, a wife, and a child. How have I ended up in this situation? I just couldn't understand why God would do this to me. He stripped off his waterproofs, struggled, swam, and stumbled in the darkness. <laughs> I tried so hard to swim through the channel. I just couldn't do it. I thought about my parents. I thought, am I going to die tonight? It was pitch black, and I was desperate. I thought I might just as well wait to die. It was freezing cold. But I didn't feel it. I was numb. Then I don't know how. A wave maybe turned me around. I was on my own. I was in the shallow water. And then a helicopter came. I kept praying and praying like my mother used to do. And I kept waving. They didn't seem to see me. But then they stopped. We have visual with... Uh... One person only at this stage uh, on a sandbank. He was the only person plucked alive from the water by rescuers that night. The other Chinese survivors had left the sands before the tide closed in. Believe it or not, I thought I saw God. The feeling at that moment is very hard for me to explain. I could not believe I was going to be rescued and that I was alive again. What followed was the most complex investigation ever undertaken by Lancashire Police. From the cockle beds of Morecambe Bay, it would spread across the globe. Lee Hua has rebuilt his life under witness protection. Together with the wife and son he feared he would never see again. He hopes no one will experience what he went through. My family are all healthy and we are happy. I have a job. We don't have a lot of money, but we are happy to go through each day peacefully. I am very grateful to the police and the British authorities. I'm glad to be alive. So, as I said, Lee Wa is called Patrick. He, he still lives in the United Kingdom uh, with his family. He's successfully rebuilt his life after the tra tragedy. And that's myself and an interpreter working with him earlier this year. Um, I talk about Mor Morecambe Bay. I like to introduce my talk about Morecambe Bay because it takes... First of all, it takes us back to the beginning of my organisation, which, which was the Gangmasters Licensing Authority. It takes us back to the beginning of my involvement in this area of business because this was my rude introduction to uh, people trafficking and modern day slavery. But I thought it's, three weeks after Essex, I thought it's pertinent just to remind everybody about Morecambe Bay. Because the story, Patrick's story is one of, of making a business decision to come to the UK. 
He didn't come here because he wanted to take British people's jobs. He wanted to come here for a better life and to earn money to send back to his family. But for them, it's a business decision. And it's really, really similar to the stories we've heard from the families in Vietnam of the recent victims. Really, really similar, depressingly similar, 15 years later. So they pay a sum of money up front. In, in Patrick's case, it's £20,000 to be brought to the UK. And then when they get to the UK, they have to work, 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 because the family back in China, or in the more recent case, Vietnam, still owes a substantial amount of money, which has to be repaid. And if they don't send that money home for that debt to be repaid, then the family become endangered. And quite often, particularly in the Chinese cases with snakehead gangs, they can be in physical danger. So that's the incentive. They have, to, they have to continue working because they've still got half the debt to pay off. So Morecambe Bay woke up the UK to the issue of people trafficking, modern-day slavery and labour exploitation. And I think before that, it was totally hidden in plain sight. Hundreds of people every day arrived on Morecambe Bay, but the authorities, the police, local authority, all didn't really quite know what to do with it. I think Phil mentioned earlier about raising, raising awareness. I think... That's something we have achieved in the last 15 years. We have raised awareness. A lot more people understand the issues around uh, modern slavery. But it's so depressing to see 15 years later another Essex. And that, these are the cases that we know about. What's going, what's going on behind the scenes, the cases that we don't know about. So the Gangmasters Licensing Authority was created back in 2005. And the idea was simple. It was to regulate certain sectors um, because if people were going to supply gangs of workers, if we were going to have gang masters, let's regulate them. Let's try and get them to look after their workers properly and behave properly in terms of things like training, uh, health and safety, um, protective equipment, that kind of thing. And I think the GLA was reasonably well regarded and did a reasonable job in regulating the sector. And then, uh, back in 2017, the GLAA was formed, the Gang Masters uh, and Labour Abuse Authority. Um, so we, we're now a regulation authority. We've still got our uh, initial remit, but we also have a law enforcement capability. We're not a law enforcement agency, but we have a law enforcement capability. And as Craig, Craig mentioned, our resources were increased, but not greatly. Uh, we, we employed 40 investigators working in four teams, and we cover the whole of the UK. That's quite unusual from a law enforcement perspective. The National Crime Agency covers the whole of the UK as well. But we have, we have varying powers in the different countries of the UK, but we do cover the whole, whole of the UK with 40 investigators. Craig's quite right. Our resources do not match the scale of the problem that we're faced with, but we are trying our best. With intelligence led, just like the police and uh, the National Crime Agency, we mount our own investigations so we can mount an investigation from start to finish. Intelligence comes in, we build on that intelligence, we can make arrests, we can execute search warrants, we can prosecute. Or we work in partnership with other organisations, particularly in this area with the Met Police, with, with whom we have a very good um, relationship. So the talking about the sectors that we're responsible for because we have a regulatory authority for certain sectors and you heard from Dame Sarah earlier that it's horticulture, agriculture and the shellfish industry in the main but we're also working in a voluntary capacity around other sectors like construction for example we've launched the construction protocol to try and get major players in the construction industry to work in the same direction so the GLA Intel picture suggests that the highest number of modern slavery reports are in the car wash sector, and as you can see on the screen, that's about 20%. Construction, 14%, and the food services sector, which is 13%. So 47% of reports received in the last quarter were about those three sectors. And over half of the reports concerned the food services sector related to takeaways. And this is really, this is really recent data, it's the last quarter. The most reports, 78%, concern sectors that aren't currently regulated by the LGA in terms of licensing. And this slide shows you, quite graphically, I think, car washes. Huge, huge issue. Um, we, don't, we don't have responsibility for regulation of car washes. Nobody does. But there are thousands and thousands of car washes in this country. There are thousands and thousands of them that are operating illegitimately. 
They're employing uh, people who've been subject to people trafficking. They're, imp they're employing people who are uh, faced with labour abuse, um, abuses, um, uh, all the way up the scale up to modern slavery. Um, I think car washes and nail bars are the main source of concern for our organisation and for law enforcement in the UK because they're completely unregulated. I'm not going to go through that whole list. You can see the kind of uh, the way that, uh, that our intelligence reports are split and you can see um, that car washes are certainly uh, a, a main concern to us. Rural against urban. Our, our intelligence reports come in from a whole host of different police forces, members of the public, via the various apps that you've heard a little about already. I'll put this on the screen just to prove that we, we do operate in, in your area. Some of you will know more about this than, than I do. Uh, with respect, I, I'm not across all the investigations that we're, that we're working on, but it's quite recent. I think it's July. Uh, or it's July of last year. So that's the last... Um, publicly available piece of information I can find about GLA acti activity in your area. Now, I do have another video, but I'm going to skip it because videos are starting to scare me. Um, and I'm very glad now I've got this slide on screen that the Secretary of State's left the room. I just want to put this up there. I'm not going to get political. We all have our own views about Brexit. But I think it's common sense to suggest that as the legitimate supply of labour slows down, then the illegitimate supply of labour is bound to increase. And companies who once would never dream of taking illegitimate supplies of labour may now be tempted to do so, otherwise they may go bust. I don't think that's an unreasonable proposition. Now this data is from the Association of Labour Suppliers, and you can see that when they're asked the question, what proportion of your non UK, EU, national, lower skilled workers, are you expecting them to leave the UK permanently? None of them say none. The, to different degrees, they're all reporting that there's a problem. Now, I, we're already, already seeing the supply of legitimate labour slowing. That's not a political comment, that's fact. That's what the, fi the figures say. This, this has got to be a real concern for those of us who are working in the labour abuse and modern slavery. Um, arena. I just want to touch a little bit on transparency in supply chains. I think Dame Sarah mentioned it earlier. 36 companies that turn over more than 36 million pounds have to put a supply chain statement on their website. Now these figures are from today. I took them off, off the TISC report website. So there are almost 4,000 companies. Now these are big companies turning over more than 36 million, some household names haven't even bothered to submit a, tra a transparency and supply chain statement. And I think overall there's about 24,000 companies that fit into this category. So we're talking about a fifth who haven't bothered. Of those who have, there's a huge proportion of those who have, where their supply chain statements are rubbish. And that's why we end up like with, with uh, instance that we heard about earlier in the West Midlands. Because companies aren't taking this seriously, they're not delving into their supply chains, they're not checking that modern slavery is, is, is rooted out, because boardrooms are not taking this seriously in, in lots of companies. This is my view, but it's also the view of my organisation. This needs to be taken seriously. We've had a carrot out there for a long time. This legislation's been in place for three years. Companies know that they should be doing it. They're not. It's like saying, you've got to wear a seatbelt, but if you don't, we'll do nothing about it. People won't wear seatbelts. So, so the view of my organisation is that we need to have much more stick and lot in the, moving forward and less carrot. And the ability to fine could be absolutely game-changing in terms of the fight against modern slavery and people trafficking. Because if we just find 1% of the 36 million turnover, we could raise almost 1.5 billion pounds. I mean, what we could do with that, in my organisation, policing, border force, is huge, absolutely huge. So, I'm sorry to be a bit evangelical about it, but I feel quite strongly about that one. That's what, slave, uh, what companies could be doing at the top end, because changing consumer behaviour is really important in the fight against modern slavery. But what members of the public could do is start to think about the nail bars that they visit. They could start to think about the car washes they visit. 
And the Kluwer Car Wash app um, is a really good example. I think apps are really important in this field. You know, young people use apps. They, geo they geolocate things. So the Clue, the Clue Car Wash app, the Church of England Clue Car Wash app, and Caroline's here, she's going to be speaking to you this afternoon, is really important because it feeds data through to the Modern Slavery Helpline about car washes where members of the public are cons concerned, but it also creates these fantastic maps that locate where the car washes that have been reported are placed. Now this was just intended for England and Wales, as I understand it, but spookily, people in Saudi Arabia are reporting car washes, and in America are reporting car washes. That's just a little bit of additional information. But from a law enforcement perspective, if you can drill down on this information, you can drill down into these electronic maps, and you can see where the car washes are in your particular area that are causing concern. Really, really a good law enforcement tool, but it also the app means that the information is getting to the Modern Slavery Helpline as well. I'm conscious of the time. Um, so how we prevent exploitation. Licensing, raising awareness, we've, helped, we've heard about, but I agree with Phil, we need to move away from, not, not move away from raising awareness, but I think the effort of organisations like mine needs to move away from raising awareness. It, it needs to be more about challenging and where appropriate prosecuting. Um, so licensing, promoting rights, supply chain scrutiny, consumer change, consumer change and boardroom change is really, really important. Very quickly, on our website, if you need any resources, we have a whole host of different resources that you can print off in terms of leaflets and posters in a whole range of different languages. And I think I finished on time, despite my IT glitch. Well done. Thank you.